Thanks very much. That was great. Going to be continuing in the Gospel of Luke this morning. If you've got Bibles, you can put your fingers in uh, Luke chapter 20. Um, I, I read to you uh, a couple of weeks ago a prayer. It's in the Middleburg Liturgy uh, as a preparation uh, for coming before the Lord. And uh, I'm going to pray that now, uh, leading all of us, asking God to give us ears to hear. Uh, and minds and hearts to receive uh, his word. So let's pray. Almighty God and most merciful Father, we humbly submit ourselves and fall down before your majesty, asking you from the bottom of our hearts that this seed of your word now sown among us may take such deep root that neither the burning heat of persecution cause it to wither nor the thorny cares of this life choke it but that as seed sown in good ground, it may bring forth thirty, sixty, or a hundredfold, as your heavenly wisdom has appointed. Amen. Okay, again, uh, Luke chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to read to you from uh, a translation that my guess would be uh, most of us don't have. Uh, It's it's the uh, New Living Translation. And... uh, the church I was at in Georgia, they were very cozy with a, an Old Testament scholar named Richard Pratt. He was one of the missionaries they supported, and he has a worldwide uh, educational ministry, and he was in on the translation committee of the New Living Translation, and so they developed an affection for the translation and used it, and sometimes it was surprising to me, and sometimes you can get something out of the reading of the Bible when you read a translation that you're not used to. Uh, although I'm going to read the passage, I want you to listen. Uh, I had a professor in seminary who said that uh, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. So he recommended that people not read while the Word of God is being read formally in worship, but listen uh, and ask God to speak to you. So if it's possible for you, in deference to God's Word, uh, please stand while I read the first 16 verses of uh, Acts chapter 20. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. While there, he encouraged the believers in all the towns he passed through. Then he traveled down to Greece, where he stayed for three months. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life. So he decided to return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea. Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy, Antichicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. They went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. After the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them in Troas, where we stayed a week. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting in the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Paul went by land to Assos, where he had arranged for us to join him while we traveled by ship. He joined us there, and we sailed together to Mytilene. The next day, we sailed past the island of Chios, The following day, we crossed to the island of Samos, and a day later, we arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. This is the Word of God, and we believe it's true. Please be seated. Okay, leaning into the passage, I just want to start off by saying that a conundrum 
uh, in the Christian faith is whither good works. Uh, to put it in plain English, where do good works come from? Uh, what is the necessity of good works, or is there a necessity of good works? Uh, but where do they come from? How do we get there? Uh, the hypocrisy of a faith without works is always scandalous. It occurs many times. It's a regular feature of life in a Christian community. And uh, faith without works, well, the Bible says it's a dead faith, uh, but to our sensibilities, it's always scandalous, and it disrupts us a little bit, especially when we hear of, of public demonstrations of hypocrisy, uh, someone who professes to be a Christian but who has a life or a, an action or a series of actions that are quite contrary to the Christian faith. Uh, on the other hand, good works that puff up and bolster pride and smugness might even be more ugly. Uh, than hypocrisy. So again, the question is, how do we think about good works? Where do they come from? How do we get them? And how do we avoid the wrong kind? Uh, if you remember uh, Heidelberg Catechism 86, uh, one of my favorites, uh, in fact, I, I told uh, Rick Lopez earlier that it's uh, one of two that I can name and go to very quickly, the other one being question one. Uh, but, but this question is, is this. Uh, here's the Heidelberg question. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace, through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? And the answer, you know, really is kind of tricky because it breaks into five segments, but I'll just read it straight to you. The answer is because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, so that he may be praised through us, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Again, complicated answer. I would invite you to go and study it later and, and pick it apart. Um, but it's a good, it's a fantastic answer. Uh, why do we do good works? Well, because Christ has not merely justified us, uh, but when we are saved by grace through faith, we understand that salvation to be not just justification, but sanctification as well. Uh, we understand that, that entry into the Christian life is a life commitment, it's a life change, it's a life that is constantly moving and constantly growing. And that's what we're going to see a little bit of here by the time I get to the end of this sermon. Um, my reluctance for narrative passages, I've mentioned before to you, uh, is, is on display here um, uh, because narrative passages tempt the preacher either to make a hero of the person in the narrative or to derive a moral uh, from the story. And sometimes I think both of those aren't quite what the passage is getting at. And so uh, because... I don't want to lure us into the wrong kind of good works. I'm, I'm nervous. Um, but that being said, uh, it's good to pay attention to what the Apostle Paul is doing in this passage. Uh, as an example, if I can say it carefully, of what happens when people become Christians, uh, when they purpose uh, to follow Jesus. Uh, so let's look at the passage and uh, talk about some of the details of it and then uh, conclude with Paul's um, actions that might be an example to us. So, uh, first off, the journey uh, is, is uh, engaged uh, after the hubbub uh, in Ephesus. And again, the, these are all abbreviated uh, stories, abbreviated accounts. Uh, but you remember the resolution that Paul made back in chapter 19 in the middle. Uh, uh, Paul resolves in the Holy Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia is Greece. Achaia is where Corinth is. And go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Uh, so we read that in the previous passage, and now that's being enacted. And again, a lot is not said. Uh, this is why Acts is a little bit confusing. You really, if you, were, if you have a detective kind of orientation, you have to go and read the letters that Paul wrote, and you get some of the, uh, the stuff to fill in uh, in between the gaps. Um, 
uh, when we read 2 Corinthians or read the end of the letter of Romans, you get an insight into what else was going on. Uh, we know from 2 Corinthians that in this journey, Paul was collecting an offering to be taken to the saints in Jerusalem because a famine had broken out there. So that's part of the purpose of this trip. And Paul was particularly delighted to be able to gather funds from Gentile churches, essentially Gentile churches, to take to the Jews in Jerusalem. You know, for him, that really demonstrated the beauty uh, of the kingdom of God and also the essential reality of his own ministry to the Gentiles. I happen to be reading in 2 Timothy this week. Again, you know, one of the little reading between the lines, and Paul says, hey, you know, I left my cloak in Troas and my parchments as well. Will you please bring them to me when you visit me later? So again, another little hint of what's taking place in between the lines of, of the way it's being described in Acts chapter 20. Uh, now, a map is helpful. I mentioned this before. There are maps in some of your Bibles. Uh, but Paul basically heads north from Ephesus along the Aegean Sea. He crosses over by ship into Macedonia, uh, has a ministry there. It's being described as encouraging the saints. And he makes his way south from Macedonia into Greece. That's the way it's described. Ostensibly, what he's done is gone to Corinth. Uh, during the trip, you know, we learn again in 2 Corinthians, he was in communication back and forth with the Corinthians on his way there. And he writes 2 Corinthians while he's on this trip in preparation for his visiting them. And most scholars think that while he was those three months in Corinth, he probably wrote the book of Romans. Uh, so all of this is a little bit complicated, but it's all taking place at the same time. Then he turns back east and south uh, to get to Jerusalem. He wants to get there uh, in time for the Passover, in time for, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's why he wants to get to Jerusalem. Ordinarily, he would sail, uh, but he finds out while he's in Corinth that there's a plot among the Jewish leadership. Uh, ostensibly, this plot would be to put him to death. And if you are afraid that people uh, have your life uh, in mind, uh, you don't want to get on a boat with them uh, and head to sea. So he decides to set out by land, walking from Greece to Macedonia, figuring they're going to miss the Passover in Jerusalem, but they hope to get there by Pentecost. They spent Easter in Philippi. Now, it's described as the Passover and the Translation I just read, uh, and some of the other translations, literally it will be describing the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, but we know from Paul's writing to the Corinthians that they were already calling these uh, feasts, or at least they were referring to these feasts with reference to the fact that they were fulfilled in Christ. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the festival. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So they spend Easter uh, in Philippi, uh, and they uh, get on a ship, and they sail across uh, back uh, into Asia. Uh, his travel companions are named. I won't go into that, but that could be a sermon. Uh, they are noted for their diversity. Uh, they are representatives of the churches that Paul had planted in Macedonia, in Asia, and in Galatia. Uh, I always want to mention, I think I might have mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that there's a prominent uh, biblical scholar in England named Richard Baucom, and he's written a bit of a monumental book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's had uh, a huge impact, and, uh, and he makes the point kind of brilliantly um, that there are so many names uh, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts that it surely was the intention of those authors uh, to provide the readers with means by which they could verify what was said. Uh, the reason these people are named is so, so that you're reading this and you can say, anybody here ever heard of Trophimus? Does anybody remember Timothy? Uh, does ever, anybody remember Sopater, if that's how you pronounce his name? And, and there would be living memories of these to testify to the veracity of what's being written in these accounts. Now, from Macedonia, the rest of the trip to Palestine uh, is by boat from Philippi to Troas, then on to Assos, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, and Miletus. Uh, the only other thing to note is in, the, in verse 5, the word we appears, 
and goes on for quite some time. Apparently, Luke himself joined the entourage when they were in Philippi. Uh, there's an odd note about Paul choosing to travel alone uh, overland from Troas to Assos while the rest of them were on the boat, but I don't know that we need to make much of that. So that's basically the journey. That's what's being described. There's a historical veracity to it, um, and, and that's a, a bit of a comfort to us that, that Luke is not just imagining this, these things. He's not just spinning a tale, uh, but he's re- recording something that actually happened. He's recording history. And so that leads us up to verse 7, uh, to this worship service. Uh, this one event stands out, but not for the reason you imagine. Uh, This is the first allusion in the New Testament uh, to Christian people gathering together on the first day of the week for the Lord's Supper. Now, we we know later on that uh, the the first day of the week became a time when they ordinarily met, uh, and by the the time the book of Revelation is written, John writes that that day uh, was designated by the Christians the Lord's Day. Uh, But here's the first, first time that you see that. Now, literally, it says to break bread, uh, so it could have been a meal, but it it probably is the Lord's Supper. That's the way the New Living Translation uh, translates it. In fact, a lot of scholars would say it's probably both. They had a meal, and they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And what's important for us to note is that the Lord's Supper is accompanied by the preaching of God's Word. And, And that's to say that from the very beginning, of Christians gathering together on the first day of the week to celebrate the Lord's Supper, sermons were preached. And I think I want you to note that it was a long sermon. It went until midnight. And if I preach a long sermon today, I've got the Bible to back me up. But it's an important theological point that I don't want to pass over. Uh, We human beings are by nature superstitious. Uh, We imagine ourselves in some kind of cosmic negotiation where if we do good things, good's going to happen. If we do bad things, bad's going to happen. Some of our prayers are really superstitious negotiations with God. If I give you this, will you give me that? The most lively prayer time I ever had in my life and the most disciplined quiet time I ever had in my life was when I was pleading with the Lord for the affection of of the woman who would become my wife. Lord, I'll do anything if you'll just give me that. Now, well, that it's superstition. It's, uh, it's not helpful. It runs contrary to the instinct of the Bible. Um, have you ever seen this uh, amusing little TV show called Kim's Convenience? Anybody ever heard of this? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Canadian show about a Korean-Canadian family, and Mr. Kim owns a convenience store. And uh, it's a lot of fun, and the, all these family dynamics and crazy stuff. Uh, but the interesting thing is, and I don't know how this happens in Canada, but it's a Christian family. And their life in the church is, is a, a very important part of the way that the show unfolds. And the pastor and the assistant pastor have, have a place. But there's one really amusing episode where the, the family is embarrassed to be caught refusing to use a certain color of ink in a pen that they use because it's unlucky. And, and, and I, I don't know Asian culture as well as I probably ought to, uh, but I know that in Chinese culture and in Korean culture as well, there, you know, what's lucky and what's not lucky looms very large. Now, we've got some of that ourselves, but I think it's more strenuous there. But they're embarrassed in front of the pastor uh, for bowing down to the superstition of what's lucky and what's not lucky in the color of ink you use. Well, again, we are a superstitious race. And it's not uncommon for Christians to view the sacrament of the Lord's Supper superstitiously. And to imagine that there is something intrinsic in the bread and in the cup uh, that is going to do them some good. If they just kind of go through the rite, if they go through the motion. Um, I, I remember a, 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 in New England, when I was there, um, a great tradition uh, that everybody, nearly everybody embraces is in the summer you go on camping trips. 
You know, the idea we've been locked up and, you know, the weather's been cold and inhospitable. Uh, so when the weather gets nice, you know, we flood to the campgrounds. And in my church, uh, there would be five, six, seven, ten couples and families that would bond together. And they say, we've made a reservation. We're going up into New Hampshire and we're going to camp out for the weekend. So our attendance was diminished during the summer. And one of the guys came to me. And this guy was an elder in the church, dear friend of mine. I discipled him, I loved him, did his wedding, baptized his kids. And it came to me one time and said, do you think it would be okay if while we're on this camping trip, we celebrated the Lord's Supper? And I said, well, what did you have in mind? And he said, well, you know, I'm going to get some bread and I'm going to get some wine, you know, and we're going to say the words. We'll just read them right out of the Bible in 1 Corinthians and we'll have the Lord's Supper. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? And I said, any notion of the preached word? And he said, hadn't thought about it. And, uh, I mean, I told him, you know, I, I guess I, should, I have to tell you what I told him. Uh, I said, you need to get your bodies up and out of the tents and make your way to a worship service that's not a half hour away. And that's where the Lord's Supper takes place. But the Lord's Supper will be accompanied by the preaching of the Word. And so the Reformers were very big on this in the Reformation uh, because the medieval church was riddled uh, with superstitious practices, all kinds of crazy superstitions. You've probably read about those. Uh, so the Reformers were emphatic. The, the Lord's Supper is always accompanied by the word preached. And that's my little theological point of the day. Um, our need to hear God's word preached cannot be underestimated. Now, you might not feel it, but trust me, that need is there. And it would be good if it were tangible. Now, your need for the sacrament is also there. But beware of superstition and note the example uh, here on the first allusion in the Bible to Christian worship as it was taking shape is this combination of the word preached and the word demonstrated in the sacrament. Because that's what the sacrament is. It's a visible depiction of God's Word. So that's the important part, but I, I know what really caught your attention, uh, the remarkable event of Eutychus resuscitation. Uh, that captures the imagination. Falling asleep in church is a time-worn tradition. You can also, if you fall asleep in church, say, this has been going on from the beginning, and I'm only fulfilling the tradition. Uh, what is notable here is that Paul demonstrates the powerful works that mark a true apostle. Now again, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Um, Paul is raising the dead. And raising the dead is no common miracle, like healing and the casting out of demons. It's something that only a few do. And it accords with what we read back in chapter 19, where it says that Paul was doing extraordinary miracles. Uh, there's only a couple of Old Testament prophets who are recorded uh, with the power to raise the dead. Of course, Jesus does it, uh, and Peter actually does it, and part of what Luke is doing in, in Acts is comparing and contrasting Peter and Paul, showing that they have very similar uh, endorsements from God as they pursue different ministries. Um, but that's what's going on. He's performing an extraordinary miracle. That's what's significant here. Uh, and it is notable that Paul himself doesn't make a big deal out of it. Did you notice that? He says, don't worry, he's alive. Uh, don't be concerned, don't be alarmed, is what he says in the other translation. And then he goes back upstairs to finish supper. It's kind of interesting. That it's a, it, you know, in, in his mind, it's a little bit of small potatoes. Only after he leaves does Luke note that the congregation was greatly relieved uh, at the resuscitation or the resurrection of young Eutychus. Uh, so maybe the word to preachers is, if you're going to preach till midnight, make sure you can raise the dead. <laughs> and I got my eye on the clock. Now I want to get to the point that I introduced at the very beginning. Uh, John Stott is a notable British commentator. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of him. Uh, I think all of his books are really worth reading. And uh, he is uh, really remarkable in the way that he can expound the scriptures. And he has a commentary on Acts that I uh, refer to. 
And he says this, it's hard to resist the conclusion that Luke, now you remember, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and then he wrote the book of Acts and, uh, and had an American uh, with a librarian sensibility been around when they were naming these books, it would have been Luke volume one and Luke volume two. Uh, but, but Stott says, Luke sees a parallel, it's hard to resist the conclusion that Luke sees a parallel between Jesus' journey to Jerusalem which is prominent in the first volume, and Paul's journey to Jerusalem, which he describes here. Now, I spent last year preaching through uh, the tra- what's called the travel narrative, and so Luke's uh, description of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem is alive in my mind. And that's a riveting section of the Gospel of Luke. It's... Uh, it's uh, exciting to notice the transition from the first nine chapters to what follows after that and the particular way that Jesus uh, ministers to his disciples on the way to Jerusalem and his determination to get there. Well, uh, Stott points out um, six points of reference, six commonalities. He says, like Jesus, Paul travels to Jerusalem with a group of his disciples. Secondly, like Jesus, he was opposed by hostile Jewish leaders who plotted against his life. Third, like Jesus, Paul made or received three successive predictions of his suffering. Very interesting. Uh, Fourth, like Jesus, he declared his readiness to lay down his life. Fifth, like Jesus, he was determined to complete his ministry and not be deflected from it. Determined to get there. Sixth, like Jesus, he expressed his abandonment to the will of God. Now, we're going to hit those passages in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, and, and, and we don't want to make too much of it. But Luke probably had this in mind. And, and what I would say about that is that um, it is important to note, and this is what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about, that when you become a Christian... When you put your faith in Jesus, when you determine to follow Jesus, your life will be progressively conformed to look like Jesus. And that's what's happening to Paul. His life is starting to look like Jesus in certain historical realities that I don't know that you and I will ever reflect. You know, we're not heading to Jerusalem in that way, although there are lessons to be learned by Uh, how and why he's doing it. But he's starting to look like Jesus, and maybe that's why he travels alone for that little bit of time, because he needs time with the Lord uh, as he's heading in this direction. You know, the benefit of being a Christian in, in contemporary thinking in the church is often tragically reduced to psychological wholeness. You know, that if you come to Jesus, things are going to come together for you psychologically where you're going to have peace of mind, you know, you're going to have an upbeat disposition, uh, you're going to, uh, if I dare say, be happy. And, 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 and all of the ways that, the, in which, you know, the fruit of the Christian life is described has to do uh, with personal benefits, again, with, you know, with a certain amount of, I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar to, you know, the, uh, uh, the Buddhist promises of, uh, of, of bliss, you know, and of contentment and of non-attachment. You know, there's a crazy overlap in some contemporary expressions of what it means to be a Christian and, you know, contemporary expressions of Eastern mysticism. Weird overlap. Now, this is not to say that there are not psychological benefits to becoming a Christian. This is not to say that one does not enjoy peace of mind uh, in becoming a Christian. That's a promise in the Bible. Of course, sometimes we have a hard time understanding what Paul means uh, when he says, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God, which is different from peace of mind. But here's what I want to say, is that it is very clear in the Bible, if you're paying attention, that the goal of what God is doing 
in saving people is conforming them to the image of Christ, is making them godly, is making them Christ-like. And and we forget kind of the, the baseline reality of the structure of the Bible, and the baseline reality is that human beings were created good and very good and ethically pure. They knew how to walk with God in the garden. They knew how to worship God appropriately. But that was ruined by their rebellion, and literally all hell has broken loose. So that we have got an instinct as human beings to transgress. We have an instinct to rebel. We have an instinct to self-assertion. And so God says, I'm going to fix that, and he fixes it by the redemption that is bought in Jesus' blood, to the end that we could not only be restored to that ethical purity that Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall, but we could even go one step further than that uh, because we will know what it's like to have been redeemed in a way that they never would have known. Now, that's complicated stuff. You could get deeper into the philosophy of it. But I just want to make this point that the life of a Christian is to become more and more like Jesus. And if I say that to you, I I hope that you will take it to heart. And I hope that there's a part of you that will say, oh, I need to rethink some things. Paul will write to the Philippians after this and after a whole bunch of stuff while he's in jail. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says, my aim in life the track on which God has me, the end for which God has saved me and redeemed me, is that I might look like Christ, not only in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. Romans 8, which I don't don't know if any of you follow R.C. Sproul. I listen to his little daily podcast, and he's been on fire this week, Reformation Week, and so he's digging into Romans. And he was talking about that, that what, they call, what he calls the golden chain. I've never called it that. Uh, in Romans chapter 8 where uh, Paul talks about those whom God foreknew, he also uh, predestined, he called, he justified, you know, all of that stuff. But he said, note the purpose of predestination. And this is very interesting. Uh, I've often said that I'm very nervous about talking about predestination because the modern Western mind can't help but equate predestination with fatalism. Um, You know that old joke about the Calvinist who falls down the stairs and he gets up and brushes himself off and says, I'm glad that's over with. (laughs) Predestination is not fatalism. That's another sermon for another day. Uh, But Sproul highlighted and pointed out that the way Paul describes it, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. So I simply want to say to you guys, to University Prez, we have loved being here. I'll say a little bit more about that in our informational meeting. Uh, In the brief month that we've been here, we've uh, really delighted in the fellowship. Uh, But I want to say to you that you need to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And you need to think about your life and to think about the places where maybe you have become content to avoid being conformed to the image of Jesus. And maybe you have thought that having been justified by faith, that you don't really need to be conformed to the image of Jesus in these certain places where it's hard for you. And in certain places it is hard for everybody. But this is a lifelong process. It it never stops. Uh, You know, the the Apostle Peter, he concludes his second letter uh, by commanding... um, 
the, uh, the people to whom he's writing to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. And that's a, a little word that kind of fits into my way of thinking and praying, that we are to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Now, the hard thing about that for us is that when you think about the word growth, you can't help but think about physical growth. You know, physically we all grow. We have little ones, and they're going to get to be medium ones, and they're going to get to be big ones. And we have plants that grow and other things that grow physically. And in, when we think of growth, we think of growth that stops. So when we grow up, we stop growing physically, and that's what growth is. But when Peter says grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus, and when we talk about spiritual growth, We're talking about something that never stops. And so you have to understand that we're talking about a different kind of growth. Now, it happens in several ways. I'm just going to highlight a few. Uh, First, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus, you have to become aware of what God actually says. You have to read. You have to listen to. If you can't read, you will listen to. You have to interact with and memorize the Bible. I don't think this could be understated. I thought it was very interesting, one of the little highlights about how crazy our world is now, that uh, Tim Keller had done some little, uh, you know, I think it was a tweet, where he said, you need to be in the Bible a lot and often. Read big chunks of the Bible every day. And, uh, and then some Weisenhammer young pastor commented on that and said, that's spiritual abuse, you know, and he was roundly denounced uh, because that's just good, solid pastoral advice. And I want to say, first, you have to become aware of what God actually says. You have to read, listen to, interact with, and memorize the Bible. Don't short-circuit that. And, and look, if you have a hard time reading the Bible every day, uh, I'm with you. Come and talk to me. We'll scheme and we'll plot. Uh, for a way to get that done. Secondly, that will drive you to the vitality of repentance and faith. If you're reading the Bible honestly, it is going to jump up and smack you at times. And you're going to go, I forgot that was in there. Lord, this kind of addresses my heart where I need to be addressed. And the vitality of repentance and faith can become an ongoing and regular part of your life. I I met a woman... uh, here in Las Cruces, uh, since I've been here, who was raised in a Christian church, and she's denounced it. You know, she said, you know, and, and, you know, who knows, her experience might have been horrific, but she said that she went off to Christian camps, and, the, and in the Christian camp, they would say, uh, confess your sins every night. And she said, who would tell the little kid to confess their sins every night? What a terrible thing to do. And uh, I was in a compromised position. I couldn't talk to her you know, at great length about it. It was only a brief interaction. Um, but, um, you know, I wanted to say to her, confessing our sins every night is the way that we access the beauty of God's love and kindness. It's a way that we access the provision that Christ has made for us uh, in his deep love for us. God loved the world so much that he sent his son. And the way we access the reality of that is by confessing our sins. But I want to say that faith and repentance are never severed from each other. Real repentance never stops at grief and guilt, but it moves into faith. And real faith is always repenting. It's always noticing the human bent toward pride, unbelief, self-centeredness. And thirdly, this in turn compels you to worship. Very interesting verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, right at the end of it. Uh, in which is described being conformed to the image of Christ by beholding the glory of God. I don't know if you remember that. That we behold the glory of God when we worship. And that itself has a transformative effect in our lives. It conforms us to the image of Christ. So a lot more can be said, um, but we need to get to the table. I hope you're hungry and thirsty. God has something for you. Let's make this our aim. Make it your aim to be conformed to the image of Jesus. If you're not a Christian, I want uh, carefully and uh, hopefully to invite you 
uh, to consider repenting and believing for the first time. Uh, not just to receive eternal life. Not just to achieve peace with God. Uh, but really, more to the point, so that you'll be able to worship effectively and, and satisfyingly the creator of the universe as you were meant to do. I mean, I would say that almost every problem in every one of our lives is because we are not able to worship God effectively. Uh, but a way has been opened. The door has swung back. The curtain has been torn uh, so that we can worship God so that we can give him thanks, so that we can enjoy. As the first song we sung said, his, the beauty and the wonder of his loving kindness. So let me pray for us. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, there are pictures in the Bible of you coming alongside your people, of Jesus coming alongside uh, his disciples, of Jesus coming alongside those who were uh, ignored and disparaged by religious leaders at the time. And we, we want that today. Uh, we want to move uh, in a direction that looks a lot like the steps of Jesus. Uh, we pray that you would use the supper uh, to the end uh, that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. We stand as we respond to the preaching.